Imagine waking up one fine morning, all ready to go about your day. But as soon as you exit your house, there's a hundred ton truck blocking your way. Now imagine having to navigate through multiple such trucks and cars and bikes, all just randomly moving about. Chaotic and scary, right? However absurd as this may sound, this is the reality for space travelers. A cosmic wasteland surrounds Earth. Some of it is natural, but most of it is artificial. However, all of the space junk poses a grave threat to us as a species. I am here today to tell you just a little bit about the gravity of the situation, pun intended, and also maybe offer a solution. I am Mihil Tendon, and here is my idea. Let me use some numbers to quantify the situation in space. Ever since Russia sent up the first satellite in 1967, triggering a space race, about 6,000 rockets have been sent up into space, deploying over 10,000 satellites. Let me ask you a question. Do you think all 10,000 of these satellites are in pristine condition? Exactly. Dead satellites, wreckage after collision, abandoned parts of the launch vehicle, these are just the big ones that can be tracked. Currently, there are about 23,000 such pieces. But what about smaller parts? Screwdrivers, nuts, bolts, flecks of paint, tiny bits of scrap metal, all of which are between 0.4 and 4 inches. Not only are they impossible to track, but they are also estimated to exceed 5,000 units. Imagine pens, credit cards, bottle caps, all whizzing about your house at great speed. At some point or another, one is just bound to bump into you and cause considerable damage. In space, they are whizzing past us at roughly 22,300 miles per hour. In 2006, a scrap of metal smaller than a penny hit a window of the International Space Station, causing thousands of dollars of damage. But that's not all. A study by the European Space Agency concluded that there are more than 130 million pieces of space debris smaller than a millimeter. Each venture into space creates a cloud of debris. The anti-satellite missile test, Mission Shakti, done by India in 2019, produced 400 more pieces of space debris and increased the risk for the ISS by 44%. One of the most significant sources of space debris is the discarded parts of launch vehicles. This is where one of my favorite people, Elon Musk, comes in. He has revolutionized space travel and brought interplanetary travel closer than ever before. Since 11% of all space debris is discarded objects, sending entirely reusable rockets into space, as Musk's SpaceX does, considerably reduces the amount of debris produced. But what about sins of the past? What about the random pen-sized and car-sized bits still floating around and crashing into each other, and hence constantly multiplying and disintegrating into smaller, untraceable, and potentially more dangerous pieces? Not only do they pose a great danger to new satellites in orbit, their presence is also a massive hurdle to interplanetary travel and space tourism at scale. Scientists are already acutely aware of the issue and the debris is constantly under surveillance by the United States Department of Defense's Space Surveillance Network. Since space travel is only 60 years old, the research to clear space is even more recent. And the space enthusiast to me can proudly say, we are now in the race to clean up space. We don't yet have government policies or laws that will make space cleanup mandatory. However, many private efforts are already in motion. Some international initiatives include spearing the debris with a harpoon or slowing them down and redirecting them using sails. In 2012, the Swiss Space Center declared the concept of janitor aircraft, which hug the debris and disintegrate upon re-entry through the atmosphere. 
Another popular experiment which scientists are debating upon is the use of lasers upon the waist. A third and easier said than done method of removing space junk is to use a big tether or net to pull the scrap metal safely down to earth. And if some parts are reusable, this would prevent money from being wasted on building new rocket parts. This idea was tested by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency with Koichi Inui as lead researcher in December of 2016. They did send the space junk collector to the ISS for testing, but the 700 meter tether did not extend and the mission was unfortunately declared a failure on February 6, 2017. In 2018, a Switzerland-based startup, ClearSpace, collaborated with the ESA for the first ever active debris removal mission. The spacecraft would capture pieces with masses of roughly 100 kilograms and push them into the Earth's lower orbit, where they gradually deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. I am just a ninth grade student, but I believe I may have an idea that complements the efforts of ClearSpace and the ESA. What if, think about it, what if we built robots the size of a twin bed with two feet tall arms that are six inches thick? Most importantly, it should have finger-like extensions that can grasp car-sized debris that have masses of around a ton and push it in the correct direction. Now, a multitude of questions must have popped into your head. Let's resolve them one by one. How does the robot reach space? I will be hopeful here and say that we will have a special mission to deploy the robot to the ISS in reusable rockets. Who controls the robot? Well, technology has now advanced to a point where researchers and technicians can control the robot from here on Earth. However, if necessary, a team aboard the ISS can also control the robot remotely. How does the robot stay afloat and redirect itself when necessary? Jets, of course. The robot will have small but powerful jets installed, along with a small air tank and a fuel resource. This air tank should also have a sensor attached that can alert the team when it is running low. So ideally, the ISS should store extra supplies for the robot. The main idea is the robot itself does not become additional junk. It could be used as a long-term solution or be brought back down to Earth. However, some disadvantages would have to be tested first. For example, the pieces of space debris should not be too large. Otherwise, they could come down on Earth as meteorites and cause tremendous damage. However, this idea can be tested by measuring the sizes of meteorites that made it through the atmosphere and ensuring that smaller space junk does not do the same by dropping them above a safe location such as a deserted island or the ocean. Now, this might temporarily contribute to pollution, but after researchers have determined the target size of space junk, we won't have to fear any of it coming down on Earth. Now, I understand that the robot may not be able to push every penny and bottle cap out of the way. But even if it can remove the larger and more visible ones, that still helps clear about 15% of all space junk. And if we can replicate the robots, we can do this work much faster. 15% may be small, but it is a considerable amount because it reduces the collision and multiplication rates of the debris. Alternatively, we could wait till 2060 for inventions that will clear out all sizes of space junk. However, by that time, Earth's orbit would have become too crowded and dangerous for us Earthlings. So a tiny start now is better than a late start then. I hope the ESA, NASA, and ISRO are listening to me because I strongly believe that space junk is not an issue that can be neglected. And I am more than happy to dedicate all my time and resources to help the cause. The future of space exploration can only be successful if the process is sustainable. I am Mihil Tendon, and thank you so much for journeying with me through space.